I'm assuming you all know where the Shingu River and the Upper Shingu region is in the Amazon. Um, it's uh, oh, there we go. <laughs> here it is, right here. Um, this is the Upper Shingu Basin. This is the, one of the Upper Top of Nose Basin. This is the Upper Arawai Chains. Um, it's a uh, um, somewhat deciduous. Uh, tropical forest. It's different than the closed and open evergreen tropical forests um, farther north. It's in the state of Mato Grosso. There's this whole band along the southern Amazon, and I'll show you in a moment, um, that's a rather different forest composition and ecology than what most people are familiar with in, um, in more core areas of Amazonia. It also happens to be, if you follow my arguments, um, well over 50% that entire macroscopic region um, and in certain areas such as the upper Shingu specifically where I work um, we reach what I call a saturated energetic landscape in other words there, there's nothing in it that isn't engaged in some coupled process with the human societies that live there um, this is kind of an image um, the archaeology in the upper Shingu um, I've worked on other time periods and whatnot, but my primary focus since I started about 25 years ago um, is uh, the archaeology of colonialism, capitalism, globalization, past 500 years. What did things look like in 1492, and how does that bring us up to um, the contemporary uh, Shingu people, such as the Kwikudu? This is their village in uh, 2003, an aerial photograph of the Kwikudu village. Um, it neatly has my house is in there, uh, it's a small one um, at the time. And what this is, is just playful power pointing um, what I believe the occupation looked like 500 years ago. It was the same kind of villages, only they were systematically organized in these clusters with the core central um, uh, ceremonial community and then four major residential communities. Um, and in the area that the one village of the Kwikudu was in 1993 when I started working with them, there are up to five villages now, but um, there was one village in 1993, um, not this very same format, different houses, but it was exactly the same village. There was one village in an area of about uh, 1,200, 1,500 square kilometers. In pre-Columbian times, there was two of these clusters. And the largest settlements in the cluster were 50 hectares rather than five hectares in the contemporary village. So this gives us a, a scaffolding from which to kind of consider what happened demographically, economically, in terms of their organization. One thing that didn't happen is their village form didn't change, but they lost these clusters. Okay. It was good while it lasted. I wonder, I guess the keyboard. I, I actually could do the entire presentation from this one slide. <laughs> 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 it's not even a problem. I don't doubt it. Uh, while we're doing this, let me just um, point your attention to this book here, which was published in 1902 um, by an Englishman named Ebenezer Howard. It was called Garden Cities of Tomorrow. And there's Ebenezer. Well, that's good. Excellent. Um, <laughs> this is a reconstruction of what he had in mind when he proposed Garden Cities as an alternative, a sustainable alternative to massive urban overcrowding in London. Um, it actually became a movement. They built several cities on this Garden City model. Um, this guy is a candidate for the father, not only of urban sustainability, um, but basically of the green movement, which was an urban movement first and foremost. Um, so look at this book. If you're interested in the history, for instance, of sustainability studies, um, this is a, a tremendous source. Uh, I'll, I've, I've worked on some, some aspects of it, not only in terms of, uh, of the Xingu and garden cities there, uh, where rather than his model, where you had just these duplicative or multiplying centers 
around an initial center and then developing four neighborhoods and then developing eight neighborhoods and the like. Um, the Shingawanas, um, this is one of their large residential settlements, uh, had a central ceremonial area, um, which is where their most powerful um, uh, hereditary chiefs were buried. Okay, this is just uh, some of the areas that I've gained my perspective from, and I'm going to run through this quite quickly, um, but just to give you an idea, when I started working in Amazonian archaeology, which was in the late 1980s, most people agreed that the vast majority of the Amazon was occupied by people very much like the indigenous groups that lived there in the 20th century. Uh, what I call the one-size-fits-all tropical forest uh, culture. Um, and... Uh, that, that viewpoint um, really pervaded uh, all of the natural sciences, um, but it also pervaded and was a continuation of Amazonia, not as a geographic place or an ecology, but as a place in the, in the Western imagination. And it's very important to recognize that scientific discovery, literature, history, and the like do not operate autonomously. And so some of the ways that, for instance, Conan Doyle presented the Amazon have situated themselves in the Western imagination. Some of you may have seen or read uh, the book called The Lost City of Z, which was about just such an Englishman who went lost in the upper Shingu region in 1925 looking for lost cities. The last chapter of the book is our work, where basically um, the point is uh, Fawcett wouldn't have seen an Amazonian city if he stumbled right across it. In fact, he apparently did in the Upper Shingu. He was looking for big kind of Mesopotamian, Grecian kind of architectural uh, cities, and he missed uh, a very important kind of thing about these societies, which was they seemed to be doing in practice exactly what our buddy Ebenezer Howard um, was suggesting, that big monolithic or singular cities are actually an eyesore for everything but human culture, um, for human health, for human equality, for human demography, for relationships with the national envi natural environment. Um, urbanism wasn't really a great plan. So this was very different than what uh, Colonel Percy Fawcett had in mind, that the Western city was the pinnacle achievement. And so, in fact, uh, Amazonian people were doing what later becomes called as urban sustainability, turns into an entire movement um, naturally. And that really, you know, kind of changes the focus. Um, here is this area of southern Amazonian forest. It also happens to be called the Arc of Deforestation. Um, and uh, we call it, uh, when, when we um, drive from the Brazilian city of Canarana uh, over in this area up into the park, Mordor, um, is the name my students gave it because when I first went there in 1992, it was almost all standing forest. Now it's almost all clear cut forest. Um, and it's a specific type of clear cutting. You know, one of the arguments that people make about a larger population footprint in the Amazon is well, they cut down all these trees. Well, yes, they cut down all the trees, but they didn't change the soil characteristics, they didn't kill the seed bank. Right, that's the difference with the contemporary development. It's just a fundamentally, um, radically different thing. Even though there's a good chance, at least the jury's out, that a good portion of the Amazon was deforested in 1492, which makes it no different from any other place. Being deforested to the scale you can do with a stone axe. Uh, and um, those are pretty tough to work. But at any rate, what you see here um, are these dots are areas where we have basically confirmed um, archaeological and usually archaeological together with early ethnohistoric information of what elsewhere on the globe would be called complex societies. In other words, not the one-size-fits-all tropical forest tribe. Um, and so all of a sudden you start seeing um, a radically different texture to the Amazonian cultural heritage. Now we're going to get to the point, and I think you all have a, just at least an intuitive sense of the fact that no one conceives of biodiversity anymore in the absence of humans. Basically across the globe, including the Amazon, 
if it's untouched, it's untouched because somebody was aware of it and not using it to one reason or another. Not because it was isolated, not because it was insulated, not because human footprints were so small. This fits into this argument. If you have this number of complex societies, the political and social networks that link them up expand across the Amazon. So what happens in these other areas? Uh, well, take the Hebrew, for instance, or the, the Ashaninka, um, who were able to mount political opposition to colonial forces in tens of thousands of numbers. And in fact, the Hebrew, who are known as the headhunters, and they're known to live in these, these atomistic, very small households, um, to be able to pull that kind of a political alliance together, and in fact, sack the three, pay, three major Spanish outholds at the time. Um, there's a classic uh, story of pouring gold down the tax collector's throat. Um, that demonstrates the nature of these networks. Yes, there may have only been one person for every square meter or something, you know, uh, well, actually, that's, that's quite dense, but 0 0.001 person per square meter, uh, let's say one person per square kilometer, uh, they were doing some radically amazing thing. Now, what happens when you compare this to uh, the Yellow and Yangtze River area of China, or to the Congo Basin, or to the eastern woodlands of North America? Or to the temperate forests of Europe, where, by the way, forest civilizations in Europe, except for Roman influence, were quite, quite different from the Mediterranean civilizations. And in fact, their footprint was very similar to stuff we see in these other forest travel um, uh, and otherwise. Um, so we see this fundamental difference between forest and what we might call oasis civilizations. Mesopotamia is an oasis. Egypt is an oasis. The Grecian Peninsula, to some degree, is an oasis based on maritime resources. And then you get a full-blown empire, um, and that has radically different kind of ramifications. But Europe, um, by the way, in 1500, in Germany, there was 3,000 settlements that were officially characterized as being cities. 3,000 in Germany in about 1,500. Anybody want to venture a guess what the average number of, of, of residents was? 400, nice work. That was what constituted a city in Germany. <laughs> so what the hell are we looking for in the Amazon? Are we looking for Tikal um, or Caracol, some massive um, Mesoamerican temple site, which, by the way, I like Athens. They're so much larger and more elaborated than the average Mayan city. I mean, if you take the average Mayan city, it's like the average Grecian polis. They're actually quite small. They number somewhere between high hundreds and low thousands of people. Um, so why in 1500 should our expectation for Amazonian populations need to be so large to get, enter into the club of urban? And in fact, it hasn't been that much of a problem except for anthropologists. When I go to urban studies meetings, uh, people just, you know, dive on this stuff. They're like, this is great. Because, and I'll get to it in a moment, um, the upshot of this argument is, well, perhaps there's something to be learned from these people. When I was at this conference, which was one of the Altamina conferences, Bellamanchi Dam conferences, of the indigenous leadership, um, you know, joining together the indigenous leadership, they asked me and a couple other anthropologists to get the paper. And it actually dawned on me what the kind of point of the paper was in the process of listening to them talk and listening to politicians talk. I said, you know what the problem is with all you folks? You're part of the problem. You're conceived of routinely by legal authorities, by developers, by scientists, by conservationists, by basically everybody that wants to comment on it, including in the news, in the media, as part of the problem. Oh, it's a human rights problem. Oh, it's a human interest story. Not part of the solution. There's nothing progressive other than a little bit of additive detail from what we call ethnoecology or ethnobiology to the Western scientific paradigms, which presumably are going to solve the the, the problems of the Amazon and the world. 
Well, our old distinguished professor, who uh, at least Marianne and I know and love, Marvin Harris, uh, I think put it best. Well, the 20th century was the century of broken dreams um, for that kind of perspective, that science, business as usual, is actually going to solve problems like world hunger and warfare and discrimination and racism. Well, at least if history is any indication, since some things have, have actually... Um, gotten worse. So where does that bring us in the contemporary world? Oh, sorry. Let, let me just run through um, the first change that we have to come to to understand the Amazon is anthropogenic. Its culture and history is no different than anywhere else on the planet. Say what we historically know are the major limons of change over, say, the past 20,000 years. For instance, the occupation of the Americas. For many people, that couldn't have happened in the Amazon because the environment was just simply too rough. Um, well, according to who? This is a 9,000-year-old projectile point that came from these beautifully, uh, um, these wonderful contexts, the stratigraphy um, just outside of Manaus. Uh, so we know they were there, and we know they were in tropical forest settings. They weren't out there with spears hunting big game animals. Um, here's another example from a period that presumably was unoccupied, according to uh, these characteristics. This is my colleague, Neil Whitehead, who, uh, who uh, passed away a couple years ago, unfortunately. We started a project with the Lakono and Berbice indigenous Zerowak folks in Guyana, uh, who are doing most of the work, uh, the co-project director, who's Lakono, and I. And our student, Andrew Campbell, who's Wapishana, which is Narawak speaking to this group. Um, well, excellent supervision, I'd say here. Um, but what did we find here? That, and here are the radiocarbon dates, which is about 5,000 years old, is a four to five meter high, 200 meter long and 100 meter wide earthen mound. Now slap that on the coast of Peru and you can call it a pyramid. This is a huge construction. It's not only that there was people just kind of eking out an existence, one with the forest, hunting the occasional monkey, maybe developing a blowgun, appeared during this region. Look at what they were doing. This is one of the oldest sites with certain characteristic features, such as the ceramics that we see all the way down to the base, such as this very, very dark sediment that we call terra preta, or Amazonian dark earth. Um, one of my colleagues, uh, unfortunately, Bill Woods, just passed away this weekend, uh, and he was a major influence in this Terra Preta uh, analysis. Bill was a colleague of Neil's, he was a colleague of mine, and others. He came up with this beautiful idea. Um, I heard it from him for the first time in Vermont in 1996. He came up and visited me at my home, and uh, he had this notion of the living soils of the Amazon. How many of you have heard of Terra Preta? Wow. We talked about last God. week. Oh, okay, okay. Well, <laughs> I was going to say archaeologists done good, right? <laughs> Look at the that. Just talk about it. That's right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, what it is, is it's soils that are uh, naturally um, one type of thing, and with the long term enduring. Um, and sometimes intensive presence of humans, they change in predictable ways, in ways that are predictably good for what humans like to do. Um, it really, in some cases, is quite simple. Uh, I was just digging through my colleague Eduardo Nevis's compost pile out behind Poseidon's house in Sao Paulo, and we were commenting on how much it looked like Amazonian terra preta. I've seen hundreds of darn things. So uh, it makes sense. But this stuff is coffee ground black based on these Munzel colors, which is a soil color chart uh, that we use. But the fascinating thing is here is they were using these natural savanna sediments, sands, and they were capping. And you can see the way, this is not a great example, but you can see the way the ceramics are all kind of horizontally oriented. They didn't just chuck these into some compost pile. They took the compost from somewhere else and packed it into thin layers and tamped it down to, in the course of a couple generations, build a four-meter-high mound. 
So not only is this like, oh boy, this is great testimony to the fact that people were developing situated landscapes. They weren't this month here, this month there, and then you know a year later move over to the next drainage. We know that they were here um, because for this period of time they were fixated on this local environment. But to pull something like this off, there's forethought and potentially labor aspects of just building conscientiously. When we first dug it, we thought it was, you know, it looked like that. It's like, oh, this is just a huge trashy. You know, what's up with these folks? So when we actually got in it and cleaned it off, um, there's 77 individual construction episodes. So the Amazonians were doing some pretty cool things at that point in time. Here's what happens in the late Holocene, and this is just an expansion of what I just told you. This is where we know. I can give you names and dates of publications for the archaeological information from all of these areas that suggest it's not the one-size-fits-all job before his tribe. These were regionally integrated populations that included large communities as well as small communities. And what the remarkable thing about these Amazonian societies are they just don't seem to organize in big, singular, massively structurally elaborated settlements, or what elsewhere would be called a full-blown city. But their networks are just off the hook. Uh, here's my friend Jim Peterson. Um, he is, uh, uh, he was shot and killed in the Amazon in 2005. We just celebrated um, an indigenous ceremony in the Kukuru, who I live with, called the Kwaru in his honor for the 10th year anniversary. There's a point also here um, that I probably won't get to, but is important to consider, which is what I call the social life of research. Um, and so we have research problems, but my current research project, which is developing a community cultural center on land I purchased with the chief um, 20 years ago, over 20 years ago, for this express purpose, the moment we finally get the money to do it, he's in the hospital needs a heart valve replacement in Brasilia. Here's another case of the social relationships themselves define the research. We didn't go looking for that. Jim happened to find it just uh, outside of one of the archeological sites we were working on because Edward and Evis, Jim and I decided that you know this would be a fun place um, to work when we weren't in our primary areas. Uh, this, likewise, is not like we went looking for big mounds. What we wanted to do, Neil Whitehead is an ethno-historian, one of the best out there. And my God, if people think I'm bad, they should listen to him talk from the ethno-history and say, these people, this isn't even exponentially wrong. We're talking power laws, large-scale power laws, of the scale of error of taking a group from 1950 demographically and turning it into a traditional society that was similar four or 500 years before. It's absolutely absurd. You're dealing with not only continental and hemispherical scale population loss, very, very large scale. Most people really want that to be over 50% across the Americas within a century of European context. Many people still defend that it could be upwards of 90%. In other words, Black Plague was just kind of a, a little bit of an appetizer for you know the, the real show, which was depopulation in Americas. Uh, and in specific epidemic situations, and epidemics that were exacerbated by the intensity of colonial violence, the intensity of colonial violence against everyone. Follow that process along. Even in frontier development today, um, we tend to be uh, looking at some rather volatile frontier areas. Uh, well, back in the day, Everyone was potentially killing everyone. They were aligning with everyone. Guess what that does when you have very powerful uh, vectors of disease? Vectors of disease that you have to consider as a driver of change, like climate. That scale 
of epidemiology. Well, what happens when people are chopping each other up is those things really tend to go south. And so you lose, like in the Civil War, um, you lose just massive numbers of people, <laughs> not just because influenza is kicking around. So at any rate, here is the man who gives us the gory freaking details on this. He will tell you about the ethnic soldiering and taking 600 uniformed Bororos to kick ass on the Kayapo, um, who you all probably know and love today, um, to basically conduct a genocide on these types of details. So we're really starting to gain a picture. But I just wanted to point this fact out, um, that many people go into the Amazon um, as if it were a social, as if it was a historical. And so it's like a natural laboratory. Let's just go in and apply our calipers and spin our test tubes and we can figure it out. Well, we can't figure it out. There's all of these human players in every single sense that are involved. Uh, this is the Asatupa site when we first started working there, Eduardo, Jim, and I. Jim was the photographer. That was either Eduardo and I standing on the edge of a ceremonial amphitheater that is four times the size of a football field. That's kind of uh, Concordia, the largest site in North America, which is located in Illinois, is uh, that's that scale. And that's widely called a city. Here are these coffee ground blacks. They just opened it up for mechanized development when we were, uh, when we were there. Um, that's the big Terra Preta uh, core area of the site. And then in several other lobes of this river bank terrace, we have what's called Terra Mulata, or what uh, uh, Terra Escuda. And it's slightly lighter soils that are in, involved, not so much in residential, intensive residential composting um, in primary residential areas, but the use of those soils to inculcate agricultural soils, lesser scale um, uh, uh, organic input from populations as well. Uh, so once again, Terra Escuda. So this site extends over about three kilometers along the Lower Negro. Basically, um, very similar to the type of settlement you might expect. If you read the first chronicles from the Amazon, uh, which um, the first one, and in many respects, the best one is 1541. And then we really don't pick up history except for around the edges until the mid 1600s. So that, um, the discovery of the real Amazon by Carvajal uh, was, uh, was absolutely critical. And he described settlements just like this. Um, here it is uh, under our, our, our friends on the right. Um, that's the site you can see, uh, same LL Bean shirt, isn't that remarkable? Um, from that from that early Holocene projectile point. Well, here we are in a late pre-Columbian site. We, we won't bore you with the details. It was occupied for a long time. There's a big old signature from about 1,000 to 1,500. Um, so we can't say, Marianne's heard this, this line, I think, before a dozen times or so. We can't say there was a million people living in Manaus, but we can say with actually great statistical confidence there was a million pots. Now, what does that mean? Well, if you get those pots kind of lined up during a time period, um, which you can in this case, that was a single construction right there. So all the potsherds are from the same basic period. Um, hundreds of people don't make millions of pots. You do the math. That's demographic estimation in archeological terms. This is why um, our sociologist friend, now retired if not deceased, but he was influential for Marianne and I, Anthony Giddens, um, referred to archaeology as the most interpretive of things next to hermeneutics or the interpretation of the Bible itself. And so whenever anybody asked me, this just happened last week, somebody from the BBC called me, said, oh yeah, Amazon's on the radar screen, God knows why, um, again. And so he said, okay, you know, how many people were there? The million dollar question, as my friend Jim Peterson used to like to call it. And some people say five million, some people say 10 million, some people, you know, obviously you need the outliers. You know, a few people think there was substantially more than that. And there's still a few holdouts for the few million. Nobody seriously anymore, but it has embedded ourselves in the way we conceive of and approach analytically the Amazon as if it was unoccupied. 
um, that reinserts itself. Even if you take huge areas of it, and in several articles, which you're probably familiar with, um, we, we comment on one of them, the original, in that Royal Society piece you just read, Charles Clements and others, uh, including me, um, Bill Woods, the fellow that just passed away two days ago, was, was an author on that. Um, and it's kind of a fine thing. We're now the Orthodox Consensus. <laughs> <laughs> what does that mean? Yes, a gray beard, um, I, I guess. But uh, the, the, the debate is, is, is radically different than somebody might recognize in looking at those articles. That actually that was just published this year was a response to the 2012 paper that they initially published, which is quite honestly not bad if you just have an opportunity to hit a dozen or so places in the Amazon with a soil coring tool. Hey, something is better than nothing. Um, but it is absolutely, I cannot say how profoundly I disagree with that as a systematic, substantial scientific analysis of uh, soil variability across an area like the United States. Just call somebody from the geological survey here and parade that kind of an argument in front of them. They're going to say, what? You're going to do... 50, 100 cores from 30 or 40 places across the United States, and we're going to do what with that? Design where people should grow their corn, design hydrological systems, you know, forest composition. And that's an area that is, I don't want to say a fraction, but it's a quarter of the types of biodiversity and species and potentially genetic terms we're dealing with the Amazon. Now, what's the problem with the Amazon? You know, why, why can it have such high biodiversity and such low ecological diversity that you can actually capture it with that kind of testing? It's flat. Europeans have been bothered by that ever since they got there. It's flat and it's green. Anywhere you go on a river in the Amazon is just a wall of green. I don't care where you are, right? It's, it's all you need to do is just drop a tree, and a year later, it's just going to be packed with green. It's the global greenhouse. So people get on the rivers, and they travel across the Amazon, and they look at things, and what they see is endless green and endless flat. It just funny looks. Uh, extremely uniform. Now, it took a long, long time for people to kind of ask somebody that they stepped off the boat and saw, you know, what they kind of thought and what, how they saw things. And then we started to get a little bit of vision in terms of the way people view and classify their own universe, the complexity of, for instance, indigenous thought and classification systems on things like nature. Uh, but what we did not have was a mechanism to understand what people were doing if we accept those power laws. And we say, okay, there's 100,000 people now spread out in this kind of way. What happens when we turn that into 10 million? And what is the effect then at the ecosystemic level? And this is what we've uh, fundamentally discovered. Um, sorry, I missed that. Uh, I, I lost my thought there. Yes, the impact of 10 million people. Um, I'm, I'm currently working. Uh, sorry, sorry about that. No, I, I uh, uh, like I said, I had to skip a few slides, and so so I lost it, and I'm about to as now. We're working. Uh, I'm working with some folks at, at University of Sao Paulo at the moment, including Eduardo Neves, but also Paula Oliveira, who does the kind of pollen and microcharcoal counting that um, that Mark Bush and Dolores Pirno and others are promoting. Um, and here, he and I are joining forces down here um, to look at what happens. I have a graduate student, some of you that may, may have known him, Morgan Schmidt, who did 3,500 soil samples just from the upper Shingu. And we published the first Terra Preta um, book. The guy, Johannes Lehman, who was editing it, said, oh, I want you to write an article on classifying Terra Preta soils across the Amazon. 
I said, I'm sorry, all I can write is a spoiler story that the variability just within the upper Shingu is equal to the variability across the Amazon. It is so variable. Let's not start cookie cuttering, cutting it up into this reflects this, this reflects that. What we're gonna have is just those few case studies determining the composition of the entire Amazon without on the ground actual uh, confirmation. And that happened before. Um, some of you are familiar with the Hadam Brazil um, mapping and, and characterization um, project that was uh, conducted in Brazil to try and uh, to map out natural resources. <laughs> and they basically, uh, if you had a soil sample from Monte Grosso, it kind of worked. Um, the orbital imagery was enough because there's so much uniformity. I mean, just think of that, just a few samples from an entire state and you've got the diversity characterized. We do not need to create the hypothetical anymore. The hypothetical that the Amazon is no less diverse in terms of soils or ecological variation than North America, than Europe, than Africa. We actually have, such as Morgan Schmidt's dissertation, 3,500 samples that say, oh my God. You know, what these people were doing with flats is just off the scale. Um, so one of the things that we're primarily interested in is looking at this area here, the Southern Amazonian uh, Transitional Forest, um, which is uh, composed of uh, mixed deciduous and evergreen tropical forest trees, um, and uh, is... Oh, there's the slide I want. This is from the science article you read. That we, we, we show where that, um, that is just based on general uh, forest characterization from Hadam, Brazil, and, and others, EBGA in, in Brazil, to come up with that. Now, here is the scale of the um, anthropogenic impact in the area I do know, the upper Xingu. And this is based on ethno-historical stuff. We haven't had a chance to do archaeology. Potentially, the area of primary impact, including these core areas that I characterize as saturated anthropogenic landscape. So what does that mean? Well, it means that whole area is anthropogenic. So let's leave aside the whole rest of the Amazon. This whole area, you just can't uh, jump to the front of the class. You could not go anywhere, in my opinion, here and just drop in a few soil cores and Happy, happy days. Have an idea of what regional occupations in the area would be look like. Would look like. Now, I'm not going to get into it here. The biggest problem I have with those recent um, surgeons of articles that adopt what used to be the orthodox consensus when I was in graduate school that the Amazon is fundamentally a natural forest. The even more problematical thing uh, is. If nobody lived there, nobody has inherent human rights over what happens there. And so, excuse us, Haone Kayapo or Hukakakwikudu, you know, if you don't mind, can we get onto the real job here, which is what conservationists or what developers disagree or agree on, and how do we deal with this? Um, and that's gotten us into um, some profoundly problematical space uh, as a scientific community. You, you can't do robust scientific research anymore without an equal component of scientific responsibility. Who are the players? Who are the stakeholders? How are they partners? How are they included in the discussion? If you basically say they were never there and we don't want to create a seat at the table for them now because they're a bunch of ignorant primitives, well, you haven't done your job. Um, and this is one of the other messages uh, that uh, the Kwikuru case. This is, there's no ethno history from the upper Shingu area, right over here. Um, but there is from the Tapajos area, right here. And this is what Peter Picampos, who's the first person to insert these people in the historical re record, had to say um, to them. They uh, exist in such vast quantity, can't count their settlements. Many times in one day, so we pass 10 or 12. Each one, there's 10 to 30 houses. Even the roads, they make very straight and wide, and keep them so clean, we can't even find a fall and leap. Well, that's what it looks like in archaeological terms. He basically described, and in other details, 
such as a harpy eagle stone pendant that high ranking men use, such as the tattoos, three simple lines that high ranking women use, such as the fact that they have a ceremonial flute house that is uh, restricted. Women cannot enter the flute house, such as their basic approaches to manioc and fishing production. Um, basically, these are sister cultures. So we've got some good ethno history from about 1720 from the adjacent Pata Sea, but they, for the same reason there was ethno history, were closer to the frontier and so have lost much of their traditional culture. And we don't have archaeology. The Xingu offers a radically different opportunity. There's cultural continuity until present times, um, demonstrable, and, and, uh, and maybe I'll get into some detail, but, but probably not. And we have uh, probably the best example of what a functioning pre-Columbian society looked like in 1492 from anywhere in the Amazon. We can say from the central Amazon there was a shitload of people, at least they left a lot of garbage, but those sites are so complex, figuring out what happened 500 years ago and 650 versus 1,000 versus 5,000 is, is sometimes very difficult. The Xinguanas, precisely because of that cluster orientation, they kind of did our job for us. They laid out a cartography, amazingly precise, um, that we just uh, basically followed. Here is a classic um, primary walled village with these big palisades and deep ditches that they built around them. Here are the straight roads. It, the bigger one is 50 meters wide. So if you have kind of clearing in the forest and the Amazonian trail in mind, that's bigger than 13th Street out there, 50 meters across. We're looking at some radically, now I got into this with the Scientific American crowd who where, where, where did this reconstruction for us because I said, look, the houses are so small. Let's see, no, I don't have one for that. But I'll show you in a moment. Around the plaza of that village you just saw, there's 24 houses. You could barely fit five around that. They're, they're, excuse me, they're, they're way too big. The, village, the houses were, were significantly smaller. So rather than like 50 or 80 of them, there was potentially hundreds of these houses in these 50 hectare. But we need to get this guy on the street so we can see him, right? The, the 10 meter high guy right there. Uh, <laughs> Or the canoes on the thing. It's, it, it just, I love the way science plays itself out. This is Scientific American um, and me battling with them, and I'm notorious for being a radical interpretivist. I do good science because guess what? Um, doing archaeology, measuring where people are and the stuff that they leave and the structures that they make is just eminently mappable. More like a road surveyor or a house builder does it. Um, than a number cruncher, yes, um, but historical science is highly quantitative in one respect, but still we've got that archaeological interpretation that fits. Um, what we have is uh, in the archaeological record a lot of ceramics for sure. These are spread across these entire sites. These big ditches, which you see here, which were mapped using GPS. I actually mapped these sites in 1993 um, using not a total station, um, but just a mechanical transit. We cut 25 kilometers of line of sight transects through the tropical forest. And needless to say, you run into some interesting things um, and when, when you do that. Um, yes, lions and tigers and bears, absolutely. Um, we, we may call them sudoku ku uh, onsa and um, you know something else, the otters are particularly nasty. I don't know if any of you <laughs> swum a bunch of Amazonian waters, but those otters, boy, you don't want to swim near them, um, which is why the Kwikuna kill them whenever they see them, right? And here was another, uh, as I was bringing the Fed president of the foundation uh, 20 years ago, um, who was then donated a boat to the Kwikuna community um, for medical assistance, who just financed um, the cultural center. Um, he wasn't able to make it this time. But when I took the president down by boat, he was horrified when the chief's younger brother put, um, put the rifle to shoulder to shoot the duck with like five or six ducklings behind it. He said, just you tell him, I'm not gonna eat that. 
I said, well, you know, Bill, I'm, I'm sorry to tell you this, you know, um, sorry, it kills the, you know, kill a deer, burn a, burn a hemlock spray, you know, kind of Native American mythology. They don't eat it either. That's shooting practice. Um, and otters are particularly high on the list. But their understanding of the relationships, um, social and ideological relationships with nature are such, there isn't one type of otter. It's contextual based bloodthirstiness, as it were, or not being kind of animal friendly. Where in other contexts, such as the fact that they take on as pets virtually every tropical forest critter that's around. Those poor jaguars, I'm afraid, do not go very long. Um, but they just had one in the village that they caught, little baby jaguars, cute as can be. It will be dead in months. Jaguars are jaguars, and they hurt people, even playfully. Um, and there's too many kids around. So those don't last for very long. Harvey eagles do actually last for very long because they build a big cage and put them in the middle of the village. Only you need somebody, and it has to be a big chief who owns that thing, because you have to literally hire people to go hunt monkey and bird and to feed it live food every day. So it's a little bit of a problem there. There's a little tiny bird that I love that's in the chief's house. Um, it's been there for five years, and he truly loves it. So they have um, uh, not an antagonistic uh, nor a completely harmonious relationship with nature. And so that's great. They're kind of like us. Let's move on, you know, to, to um, kind of, you know, how they are and how they're different. Okay, let's move. Oh, the hour was with, with questions. Okay. Um, well, let, let, me just, uh, let me just get through the, the kind of punchline here there then um, as quickly as possible. Here's what we do with GPS. After 2000, we go in there with a Trimble $20,000 machine and we get you know, 10 to 30 centimeter accuracy on stuff that's actually better even than we can get in Florida with a beacon right on campus. Um, and sure enough, you know, got the satellite uplink service. For anyone who wants to know, it's like 800 to $1,200 a month. You can go there, you can get on your satellite pack and boom, um, look what we find. And then when we start connecting the dots between these, uh, these GPS locations, um, that looks more like Manhattan than Sparta ever did. Or one of those German official sites. So what's going on? And this actually somebody at Urban Studies, an Urban Studies professor came up to me afterwards. He says, I got to tell you, this traffic shit, this is great. Half of my department, it was like 30 professors, studies traffic. And it's all very uninteresting to me. You made traffic interesting. So they loved this. They immediately gravitated towards it. And afterwards, I was sorry I didn't ask him, well, how many people in there study whether they're making things out of brick, stone, or steel? Um, which is kind of the way archaeologists study cities. You know, what are, they, what are their building blocks? not what's going through them, how things flow, what the movements are. Um, so uh, here was the second cluster. This, sorry, let me, uh, here is a clear cluster of settlements. There's a ceremonial one. Here are these 250 hectare ones. They're connected by land. And then here are the secondary walled villages. There's still about 30 hectares and they're connected by water. And we thought, this was the other cluster that there was a slightly different pattern. They didn't have the ceremonial center. It was the same as the residential center. And it connected up with these. This is the beauty of indigenous knowledge. I say to um, you know, the people who worked with me for many months, over uh, many years, over a couple decades, you know, go to this site and tell me if there's any of those moats. You remember like we mapped on this site. So they went and they didn't find them. And there's, we, we didn't find any when we went there together. And they did find them in a couple of other places. Well, all of a sudden, and this is just two years ago, by re-looking at the imagery and using indigenous knowledge, even though I wasn't there to do the field research myself, I trust them as research partners, which is why we include them in um, the authorship of our papers. 
Here's another remarkable thing. When I heard from one of the science editors that our papers were the only ones that had Native Americans in them, like ever. So I think, wow, that's kind of wild. But at any rate, look at this stuff. That's identical. Those are absolutely identical. That is a, that is a blueprint model. That is fundamentally the definitional characteristic once you get past stone pyramids of what urbanism is as opposed to non-urbanism, which isn't oriented to these systematic and formal relationships. Well, what happens when we start playing around with it? This was an Andre villas boys request, who is, uh, works with the Institute of Soci Ambiental. He was, uh, he's been working in the Upper Shingu as long as I have, since the early 90s. He organized this, this uh, conference, and he said, we've got to find a way to get a proxy for these big communities from the satellite images. They said, well, you know, I had a, P I had a student who did a PhD on that, but guess what? We gotta go back to the field. Um, it's remarkable to me, you know, what, how uh, more and more novel that starts to seem to me, that we keep going back to the field and back to the field and back to the field. Most people don't do it. They just want the algorithm. The algorithm shows some very clear anthropogenic locations. Well, in part, it makes sense because the algorithm was created based on our archaeological distributions, ground-based data first, then the algorithm was created, then it was applied, and I can tell you just from wandering around the forest uh, over the course of two and a half years of my life that there was a lot of false hits. So I was like, sorry, Andre, we can't launch that to, you know, say these are areas that should fall under indigenous um, uh, land rights laws. Uh, but what we did find, I look at these things. What's up with them? They look remarkably terrace. -like. They could be natural, they could be cultural, they could be an optical illusion of the images themselves. They just happen, it turns out. I've got these all across the area. Sorry, look at all of them. That's the area Andre was interested in. I've nailed these all across the area. The interesting thing is there's big areas where they absolutely should happen, and they don't, which makes the optical illusion and natural kind of idea less like we need to go and test that. Um, but look at that. Whoops. Sorry. Look at that, too. Look at that. That's the area of the kind of core... Um, production areas of these clusters. This is what I need. You find me the pristine forest here. You find me, you know, where uh, um, we don't have, even if it's indirect, human influences on the natural environment of a scale that we have to conceive of ecological biodiversity, ecosystemic biodiversity as anthropogenic. Not specific species, not domestication, not genetic modifications, but entire ecosystems were fundamentally anthropogenic. Um, that's all you all know about these three levels that people use to characterize biodiversity, genetic species and ecosystemic. Um, in the Amazon, it seemed like ecosystemically, one size fits all. Um, well, that's not the case. Now, uh, oh, God. <laughs> Gotta show yeah, we got to show these, and, and I just, I can't help it. Every time I, 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 I uh, hear about geoglyphs lately, I just want to throw Stonehenge in there. <laughs> um, it's, uh, th these are spectacular. Uh, They're big. Mike and I walked around. Okay, just the last couple of points, and then, then uh, uh, Marion, five extra minutes, maybe. Um, <laughs> Look at what happened between when I first moved there until now. This is also ESA. Uh, this, is, this is why, you know, this is one of the most profound battlegrounds for this kind of conservation development theme. Okay, here's another issue that is of, of great interest to us. Um, what's going on with climate change? Now, here's a couple of periods you probably haven't heard about. This is the medieval warming period. This is the Little Ice Age. Those are anthropogenically generated climatic periods. This is why we can call this period we're living in an anthropocene. 
when does human influence become a primary driver of climate? Not when somebody, you know, cut the right stalk of wheat and there was a slight influence on the ecology that could potentially in regional or localized terms affect larger scale climatic processes. That's happened potentially for millennia. What didn't happen before about a thousand years ago is when humans and the processes that humans were involved in um, denuded forests to such a rate that it had an effect on warming. This is the medieval warming period, and that's what it's related to. And the Little Ice Age is what happens when, starting in 1350 to 1400, you start taking a vacuum cleaner and sticking it into kind of these continental areas. Say, okay, India and subcontinental Asia, we're gonna suck out 30% of your population. Europe, 30, 40% of the population. New World, particularly, the specific onset is more or less um, uh, when Columbus came. There was a massive reforestation event, probably related to demographics. Um, this is what we're working on in, uh, with the University of Sao Paulo. Taking these late bottom cores and pollens and microcharcoal and micro plant microfossils from archeological sites. Here's a core that we did. This is the somewhat counterintuitive uh, result. We see those big anthropogenic landscapes, large settlements, big production areas, potentially huge terrace areas. Um, what's up with that? If it was in some other place, that would be considered forest conversion farm areas, right? And so you would expect that there would be greater grass to tree pollen. Well, what happens from 3,500 on, and 3,500 was what's called the hypsothermal or mid-Holocene, um, which is when, when the, the greatest period of warming, um, probably within 100,000 years or so. And this is the very end of it. And during that time, we would expect that grass would be higher than trees. In other words, the upper Xingu is like central Brazil today, right? It's savanna and open forest land, not tropical forest, because it was climatically warmer. Well, we should expect then that there should be some increase in grasses associated with large pre Columbian deforestation. There isn't. There's more tree pollen. What does that mean? Probably what it means, the hypotheses that we're working on, is rather than converting forest to farm, they were converting forest to forest. And it was these systems of tree and forestry management that included open clearance. But once again, this is the really critical thing. If you open up a hectare and just keep passing your stuff across it and keep cleaning it for roots and whatnot, you're going to ultimately radically change the seed genetic bank that's represented in that area. If you don't, Doing manioc farming doesn't necessarily change the forest structure if you let those areas kind of heal themselves up, grow back, and you have this undulating landscape. Um, and so that actually um, is a remarkable clue to uh, understanding how we might preserve anthropogenically created biodiversity in the Amazon basin. Um, and fisheries management is another element. I'm not going to get into that. Uh, we're working on a water quality and fish farming project at the borders of the park to protect against sediments and chemical influx from fazendas using pre Columbian technology and also potentially using the pre Columbian forest management technologies when we know them better to do restorative uh, forestry outside of the park. That's the Kazi uh, Kultura. The Pikulu Cultural Center. This is a project I've been working on for two years, which has kept us off the climate change. And also, right. I left 30 seconds for five questions.